Well, it is great to catch up with former Browns running back Peyton Hillis, who joins us as the Browns get set to play in Thursday night football against the Cincinnati Bengals. Peyton, you're a, uh, you're a sight for sore eyes. I'll tell you, it's been a while. It's good to see you. How you doing? Man, I'm doing great. Honestly, you haven't really aged at all. You look the exact same to me. <laughs> so do you, man. You yeah. look like you could go out there and get us a, a third and six on a run. Hey, I'll tell you right now, after watching that game on Sunday, I feel like I probably could. Uh, <laughs> even though, I tell you what, you know, in, in my opinion, the running back core is there. You know, I thought that uh, it was just bad chemistry on the offensive side of the ball. I think we had a ton of playmakers. Uh, you know, it, it, we made a lot of mistakes, you know, weren't in sync. But I have a, I have a lot of uh, po a, a big positive outlook for the offense in the future. I really do. Yeah, well, we all hope that. It's certainly, certainly on paper, it looks like it's an offense that can be really good in a lot of different ways. But I have to tell you, that running attack between Nick Chubb and, and Kareem Hunt looks like it could be a real problem for any team to handle that goes up against the Browns. Yes, sir. I mean, there's no doubt about it. Uh, I mean, they are a great one-two tandem. They, they really are. Uh, you know, Nick Chubb, in my opinion, is top five running backs in the league. And Kareem Hunt, you know, he could be a starter in a lot of other teams in the league. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, we're very thankful and blessed to have him on the, uh, on our side for sure. Hey, let's go back to when you came to the Browns. It really, it really jump started your career, didn't it? I mean, it, you really found a niche when you came to Cleveland, and you capitalized on on that. They saw that, and you became the go to bread and butter guy in that in that offense that year. And you had a wonderful, wonderful season of over eleven hundred rushing yards. What was it like for you to come to Cleveland and then just become such a big part of that team? Well, you know, I when I started out in my rookie year in Denver, uh, you know, I was starting fullback out of college and then around seven running backs got hurt. And I remember my start was against Cleveland on Thursday night football. Right. And I ended up winning us the game. And I went on for like seven or eight games there with 100 yards rushing, almost had 1,000 yards my rookie year. And uh, including passing and rushing, uh, then I got hurt. And then the next year they brought in Josh McDaniels that didn't use me at all. But the good thing that happened my rookie year is I played Coach Mangini at the Jets when their defense hadn't allowed a 100-yard rusher in I think it was like 20-something consecutive games. And um, I ran against him and had a big game. And I know he remembered me. I think that's why he reached out that year because he saw that I had potential. And even when I came into camp for the first time, he's told me again and over and again, he goes, I'm looking at you to run the ball a lot. And that shocked me. And uh, he believed in me. And I think that kind of propelled my uh, propelled my year that year for sure. You know, um, tell me this. There was, uh, there was a point where the Browns offense really kind of got on a roll at that point in time. You were a big part of that. And didn't we have a big game against New England where you just kind of ran them right out of the stadium? And as I remember it, I mean, they waved the white flag at the end of the game and had to take Tom Brady out. You had such a big ball game. Colt McCoy had a big ball game, I think. And then the Browns kind of blew out those uh, dynasty New England Patriots. You know, that was one of those games that, um, uh, you know, it seemed like nothing could go wrong. We did everything right. And, uh, you know, it just seemed like everything we did, they couldn't stop. And uh, to see the frustration in uh, Tom Brady's eyes that day was really great. But one of the best things was is uh, I actually have a picture of it, of uh, Coach Belichick coming to me after the game, and he was saying, you're a one hell of a running back. And he goes, I, you know, I wish I had one like you on my team. And that meant a lot to me because you're talking about one of the best coaches in the league that may be ever. And, uh, you know, that was something special to me that day. Yeah, you know, now that you say that, I would I would really say that would be pretty accurate that you would be the kind of player that would fit very, very well with Bill Belichick. And obviously Eric Mangini, who, of course, had the, you know, was with Bill Belichick for so many years. You know, I would definitely love him more now than uh, it was when I was playing <laughs> just because, uh, you know, back then, under the Belichick tree, you know, I played underneath, uh, uh, you know, that guy, Josh McDaniels. Then I um, went uh, 
after I heard Joshua Daniels, we went two a days every day during training camp. You right. know, there was nothing. And now they don't even have two a days no more. So, you know, playing with them would be like playing with the other team. And then you got all that knowledge they can give you. It'd be huge. Yeah. Tell me this. What was it like when the Browns fans voted you to be on the cover of Madden? You know, my first, if I had one word to explain it, I'd say family. Yeah. Because, I mean, I didn't think I had a shot at all. And that's not because I didn't think the fans would vote for me. I thought that, you know, maybe it's kind of a scam. You know, maybe they're going to make it look like a vote. But, you know, when I talked to the guys at EA Sports, they said it would even close with the voting. They said that uh, Browns fans really, really did you a great a favor. And ever since then, I've been so uh, in touch with uh, Cleveland and with the Brownies. And the thing about it is I look at Cleveland more as of a home than, you know, even where I'm sitting now. Even when I played at the University of Arkansas, I mean, Cleveland mm -hmm. is where – my heart belongs. I mean, it really is. I mean, it really, is. if I didn't have a wife and two kids right now uh, living by her parents, I'd be moving up to Cleveland for sure. <laughs> wow. How about that? How about that? Um, so you really felt, you felt the love of the Browns fans and you've given it back because you, you really stay in touch with what the Browns are doing game in and game out. Right. Well, you know, the Browns sum me up as a person. Um, you know, I really, started understanding that uh, the year I, years I was playing there. You know, I love that they're old school. You know, Cleveland's a big town, but it's a, it feels like a small big town. Everybody knows you. No matter how you're doing, your fans will support you. I mean, they stuck with the same jerseys for 50 years. I mean, they're old school like I am. I mean, everything about them is, is the epitome of who I am. And it's something about uh, being a Brown, mm. uh, that it just envelops your soul, that makes you, you know, it, it makes you feel like you're accepted, that you're loved, that you have a family. It's like the best therapy uh, session you could ever be in. You know, I'm going to tell you this, um, and I'm not pulling your leg on this one. You drive down to the stadium on a Sunday morning, and you go, you know, fans are filing down 9th Street and, you know, making the pilgrimage to First Energy Stadium. And I'll be a son of a gun. You'll see all different kinds of jerseys. And then I'm not kidding you, Peyton. There, all of a sudden, there's a kid, and he's got a hellish jersey on. How about that? You know, I, you know that was uh, one of the greatest things about the years I played there. I, you know, I think somebody told me that I had the second highest jersey sales that year. Yeah. And and I was just thinking to myself, like, Lord, like, am I, I'm not that good. But, you know, as much as I felt like the Browns gave to me, it seems like I gave something back that they loved and that they appreciated. And um, and I'm telling you, every time I stepped on that field, I really wasn't playing for myself, only except to score a touchdown and jump in the stands. <laughs> but uh, I, I mean, but I'm telling you, being a Browns player is the highlight of my life like, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Um, let's bring your uh, let's bring your partner in here, and we'll talk about the podcast. Hey, Keith, how's it going? Good. All right, let's talk about the podcast, and either one of you can can tell us. It's called In the Backfield, right? Yep. Run, yes, it, sir. run it down for us. So, how me and Peyton met was kind of cool. We uh, we kind of connected and then started the podcast. But he was, you know, I was telling him how Northeast Ohio, Cleveland, you know, especially, still loves him, still wants him, to, still wants to hear from him and everything. So we kind of sat down and we got the podcast rolling. It's on Thursday nights, uh, six thirty p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You can check it out. And uh, he talks Browns football. We talk everything. Indians. I mean, it's a, it's a Cleveland show. It's a Northeast Ohio based show. We do talk other sports, you know, um, as it comes. But we really we really hit hard on Cleveland and Northeast Ohio. You like doing it, Peyton? I love it. And because I get to talk about something that I do have knowledge in and I do have some inside information about, you know, what's going behind the scenes so I can relate to fans, you know, you know, the media may say this, the uh, coaching st staff may say this, but right. this is what happens in the locker room. This is how things can make a winning team or not. It depends on these variables here. And, uh, you know, I'm, we're hoping that we're getting to uh, through the fans that way just because, you know, 
I want the fans to know the whole story, you know, not just what they read in the newspaper or, or what they see on TV, but I want them to know the ins and outs of everyday football when you're in the, when you're a Brown. Yeah. Keith, tell us how do people find the podcast? So we're, we go through Twitter. You can uh, go to Facebook in the backfield on Facebook. Um, pretty much anywhere where streaming services are, we're on. Uh, we podcast on iHeartRadio as well as iTunes, Google, Spotify, all the major ones. Wow, that's that's terrific. Okay, this is a big game uh, against the Bengals. You can wash that bad taste you get right out of your mouth uh, from on Sunday's game against the Baltimore Ravens, um, and get in the win column and get get this thing rolling. I think though it's only game two. Both of you can answer this. It's important. Well, any. <laughs> any division game is important for sure. And, uh, you know, to me, it is uh, – the Joku, is he going to be – is he hurt or is he, he going to be hurt. playing? Yeah, no, he's hurt. He went on IR. He's got a bad knee. He's going to be out at least three weeks. Jeez. You know, that's that's a loss that we're going to miss very much. But, you know, like I said before with the offense, I – the score was worse than I thought the game should have been. Yeah. I think the offense showed tons of talent and could have, I mean, the chemistry is just off. There's something there that's not all. People made mistakes. I mean, uh, Mayfield's interception really wasn't his fault. You know, there's a lot of timing on the receiver's part. Right. And, uh, you know, there's just a lot of things that went wrong offensively that uh, that's very fixable. You know, it's not like they just really got out man to me. It just seems like the defense got really tired towards the end, especially in the second half. And they started putting points up. Yeah. Uh, Keith, what do you think? Big game. I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm not panicking yet. I, I think we're going to be all right. I think, like like Peyton said, as soon as the chemistry reaches uh, the point where, you know, Baker's on point and there's no divisions or no um, distractions, that's going to happen. I'm not one of those people that, you know, yell fire as soon as the first game. I mean, look, we didn't have a preseason. We have a new coach. It only makes sense that we're going to go through some bumps. I'd rather get them out now than, you know, down the stretch. Yeah. Peyton, what about this um, the, This week leading up to this game? There's been this common story daily now, and it's growing. How do we get the ball to Odell Beckham Jr., and why aren't we getting the ball to Odell Beckham Jr., and where are all the big plays that he made when he was with the Giants, and now he's with the Browns, and those don't seem to be happening? Well, I guess three things will come to mind with me. History, uh offensive scheme and attitude. Um, to me, the history of Odo Beckham's, you know, I like like the rest of the Browns players have to go through new coach, new offensive system. You know, you have to learn new, new, new plays every year. So you're going to be off balance with that automatically. Number two, uh, you know, this offensive scheme, you know, it's, it's, quite different. It's, it's a lot different than what he's been used to in the past. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the, the balls will come. Uh, I just hope that his attitude is, you know, in check and where it needs to be. He's a great player and people are going to respect him. I mean, sometimes he's going to get double coverage and hopefully he looks at that like, Hey, Hey, I'm helping my team win, you know, instead of, you know, they're, they're not throwing me the ball. Right. Good point. I think, that, I think that's a really good point. On that, um, are either one of you worried about Baker Mayfield? I tell you the truth, I think uh, he's a Brett Favre type of quarterback to me. Yeah, um, he's very he, sad. He would like to hear you say that. He—that's his hero. Well, I mean, like honestly, I think he's a Brett Favre type of quarterback. He's very savvy, and uh, I think he's very decisive with his own with his own mind of what he's going to do. Mm. Uh, you know. Last year, he wasn't very comfortable in the pocket. Uh, this past Sunday, definitely wasn't very comfortable in the pocket. Uh, you know, I think he does need that protection to show his full potential. Right. But uh, he seems like that guy that can, you know, move around and make plays if he has to. I just hope that we can get our play action game going with our running game. And if our offensive line holds up, I mean, I'd really say people watch out. because I mean, it, it, some great things can happen. Okay. Keith, when's the next podcast drop? Uh, next thir or this Thursday, so we'll be doing it right here in Northeast Ohio. Um, we do it uh, in our studios. He zooms in, so we'll uh, we'll be on um, six thirty p.m. Eastern Standard Time. All right, we look forward to it. Hey guys, thanks very much, Peyton. It was great seeing you, Keith. It was nice meeting you.
Thank you. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Hey, brother. It's not seeing you again. You got to tell me what you do not to age, all right? <laughs> you got to you, you gotta give, me, you gotta give me that drug, whatever it is. I'm going to bottle it and send it to you, all right? Good deal. Good deal. <laughs> Thanks, guys. See you. Take care. Bye-bye.